This message is, who is this Jesus? There's a question that is floating through the, our age and generation, and it is a question about the divinity, the truthfulness of this man who lived 2,000 years ago known as Jesus Christ. I am going to make a statement today that is going to be very strong and is very politically incorrect. I don't care what other religions say. I don't care what other philosophers say. I don't care what theologians say. If they disagree with what the Bible says about who Jesus Christ is, I am going to declare publicly that they are wrong. Not because my opinion overrules theirs. The Bible overrules their opinion. The Word of God is the final statement on the matter. And what the Word of God says about Jesus, I bend to. And I am going to preach that today. If you don't respect the Word of God, you may not like this message. But if you love the Word of God in text, it forces you, it causes you to love the Word of God in person. What it introduces you to is majesty, beauty, and holiness. And you can't help but when the Spirit of God rushes into you to love this great Jesus. And so when we say, who is Jesus? Boy, I could start out by saying, he is my everything. He is everything I love and adore. He is everything I want and desire. However, Let's build a case for that. If I'm a lawyer, I'm going to lay out a case for who this Jesus is and for what the Bible says about him. In 2 Corinthians, Paul is making a statement to the Corinthian church. This is his second letter. He's having troubles with the Corinthian church. They have a tendency to go wayward. And they have a tendency to believe the lies of the devil. And they have all sorts of schisms and factions. They've had all sorts of problems in Corinth. And Paul is writing again to them. For I am jealous over you with godly jealousy, he says. For I have espoused you to one husband, that I may present you as a chaste virgin to Christ. But I fear lest by any means as the serpent beguiled Eve, or deceived Eve, through his subtlety, so your mind should be corrupted from the simplicity that is in Christ. Which means, in the Greek, the word simplicity means the singularity of focus or vision. In other words, this is about Jesus. But when we get distracted onto all these other issues. And I tell you, in Christianity, we can get distracted so easily onto other themes. When God says, this is the point, and this, it's Satan himself that is beguiling, is attempting to woo away the attentions and the affections of the body of Christ to focus on something outside of the simplicity, the singularity of focus on the person of Jesus Christ. Oh, little town of Bethlehem. We could sing the song, but we're going to restrain ourselves. And uh, that's just a subtitle for us. I'm going to read this, and most of you in here have heard at least this statement, whether or not you've read Micah 5, 2 or not. But thou, Bethlehem Ephrata, though thou be little among the thousands of Judah, yet out of thee shall he come forth unto me that is to be ruler in Israel, whose goings forth have been from of old, from of everlasting. There is one, a ruler in Israel, who is prophesied in the book of Micah, who will come to Israel and he will be the ruler. He will be the king. And he will be born, as the Jews always understood it, in Bethlehem Ephrata. And this ruler who will come is not just a mere man. His beginnings will not be in Bethlehem. He will actually come from of old and from everlasting. You see, this one who will be born in Bethlehem is no just mere man, though he will be born into the body of a man. He is God Almighty. And so let's begin to make a case for that. Who is this Jesus? Well, the Bible declares that he's from of old, from everlasting. He's actually the creator. Now, there's been an argument in Christian history, and it's sponsored by the devil himself, and that is to diminish the godness of Jesus Christ. It's known as the Arian heresy. There was a man named Arius who spent a great deal of his energy attempting to diminish the godness of Jesus Christ. And there was a man named Athanasius that stood strong in his generation against this heresy. And most of what you would probably believe in here is that Jesus is God. Though he is man, he's also God. And that is critical in the body of Christ. And by the way, the Arian heresy is still knocking on the door of the church, and the emergent movement is following heavily in that direction to diminish the deity of Jesus. We could say, how would, why would anyone do that? 
It's not intentional always, even though it is on the part of the devil. It starts with the diminishment of the word of God. When you diminish the text of scripture and you begin to say, well, it's just good words written by good men, and God endorses it. I mean, he likes the book. He's not against it, but it's not God's word. It's men's word. You see, when you diminish the word of God in text, you diminish the word of God in person. And as we're going to see in this message, that word of God in person is known as Jesus Christ. The word of God in text makes it very clear who Jesus Christ is. The only way to avoid that is to diminish the word of God in text and to say, well, you know, it's just making things up. But the word of God in text makes it very clear who Jesus Christ is. In the beginning was the word, and the word was with God, and the word <clears throat> was God. The same was in the beginning with God. Uh, it's actually saying that the word was in the beginning with God. The word, as anyone would know in studying out John 1, is Jesus Christ. All things were made by him. Did you hear that statement? All things were made by him. Well, wasn't he born just 2,000 years ago? How in the world could all things be made by him? And without him was not anything made that was made. He was in the world, and the world was made by him, and the world knew him not. And the word was made flesh, known as Jesus Christ, and dwelt among us. And to make all men see, here we are in Ephesians 3, and to make all men see what is the fellowship of the mystery, which from the beginning of the world hath been hid in God, who created all things by Jesus Christ. God created all things by Jesus Christ. Wasn't he just born 2,000 years ago? How in the world could God have made all things through him? That's a strange reality. Unless Jesus is the creator. For by him, Jesus, listen to this, were all things created. What? what? What do you do with that? That are in heaven and that are in earth, visible and invisible, whether they be thrones or dominions or principalities or powers, all things were created by him and for him, and he is before all things, and by him all things consist. Mere man? Good prophet? No, he's God. Do not diminish the godness of Jesus. You are defying the very word of God on that matter. Jesus is not just an everyday Joe. He is God come to this earth in our skin to rescue us. God hath in these last days spoken unto us by his Son, whom he hath appointed heir of all things, by whom also he made the worlds. Okay, I don't know if you've caught on. I'm, I'm giving plenty of legal backing for my statement. And thou, Lord, in the beginning hast laid the foundation of the earth, and the heavens are the works of thine hand. Speaking of Jesus. Thou art worthy, O Lord, to receive glory and honor and power. For thou hast created all things, and for thy pleasure they are and were created. God is the creator. He's the idea maker. He's the one behind it. He's the inspiration behind it. He's the doer of it. Who is this Jesus? Well, the Bible declares that he was and is God. Now, I know that I basically made that same statement in what I already said, but I also want to layer this onto it, just in case you're wiggling in your seat saying I'm not fully convinced. For this man, Jesus, was counted worthy of more glory than Moses, inasmuch as he who hath builded the house hath more honor than the house. You know what that statement is saying? Jesus built the house that Moses literally was in. For every house is builded by some man, but he that built all things is God. So who built the house that Moses carried, which is the kingdom of Israel? Jesus, technically, according to this. Jesus is the root and the offspring of David. David is a mere player in God's history. But who is the sponsor? Who was the root? It says Jesus was. And then who came out of the loins of David? Out of the very seed of David? Jesus in genealogical descendancy. Jesus comes out of David. But who's the one that even started the whole line in the first place and created the whole thing and created David? Jesus. What a story. Jesus sets the stage and makes the whole story unfold. And then he says, and you need a rescuer. You need a rescuer. The word is speaking. You need a Messiah. Your Messiah will look like this. And then who comes onto the scene? The very one that spoke it in the beginning. 
He fulfills his own word. He knows his word because he is the word and he fulfills the word. He builds the stage and then steps out onto it. For in him, Jesus, dwells all the fullness of the Godhead bodily. For it pleased the Father that in him, Jesus, should all fullness dwell. Christ Jesus, who being in the form of God, thought it not robbery to be equal with God. Now I know some of the modern translations diminish what it says in Philippians 2, but this is what it says. It says, Jesus thought it not robbery to be equal with God. It wasn't a criminal act on his part to say, no, I'm equal with God. But in knowing that, he humbled himself and became obedient as a servant, even knowing he was God. What a statement. When Jesus saw their faith, he said unto the sick of the palsy, Son, thy sins be forgiven thee. This is in Capernaum, where the man is carried up onto the roof and set down through the hole in the roof. And, and when, it says, When Jesus saw their faith, he said unto the sick of the palsy, this is the guy on the mat that is set in front of Jesus, Son, thy sins be forgiven thee. But there were certain of the scribes sitting there and reasoning in their hearts, Why does this man thus speak blasphemies? Who can forgive sins but God only? You know what Jesus was doing? Jesus knew exactly the culture he was in. And he says, son, thy sins be forgiven thee. And everyone goes, what? How dare he take on a position of deity? This is blasphemy. He's literally taking the position of God. Hey, hey, brace yourselves for this one. He is God. I and my father are one, and the Jews are horrified, tearing out their hair. How dare he? How dare he claim to be equal with God? Therefore the Jews sought the more to kill him, because he not only had broken the Sabbath, but said also that God was his father, making himself equal with God. Jesus himself made himself equal with God. Jesus himself testified to this. This is his statement on the matter. You want a red letter Bible? Well, there you go. He himself incriminated himself, if you want to look at it that way. Either you believe him or you don't. I, for one, believe him. He is the truth. And when he says he's God, I believe it. And there's reason for that, and I'm going to give my legal argument for it. Who is this Jesus? The Bible declares that he is the word of God. Now, I know most of these things I've already clarified even as I'm going through, but I'm going to stop on each one and I'm going to lay out at least a basis for it. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. The same was in the beginning with God. All things were made by Him, and without Him was not anything made that was made. And the Word was made flesh and dwelt among us. And he was clothed with a vesture dipped in blood. This is speaking of Jesus in Revelation 19. And his name is called the Word of God. So there's not a lot of argument probably in here of saying, well, I don't know about that. He's the Word of God. He is the Word made flesh. He is literally the entirety of the Scriptures, the entirety of the enunciation of God in the Old Testament in human form. He's like the bodily representation of everything that was in text throughout history. He is the Word of God made flesh. By the Word of the Lord were the heavens made, and all the host of them by the breath of his mouth. Now, we already established who the Creator was. Who was the Creator? Jesus. And what does it say here in Psalm 33? It agrees with that. It says, by the Word of the Lord were the heavens made. Because who is the Word of the Lord? Jesus. And so by Jesus, the heavens were made, and all the host of them by the breath of his mouth. Now we know that God spoke, and it was so. Well, that's the Word. The Word is literally the Creator. And so God, through Jesus, created the heavens and the earth. Je God, through the Word, created the heavens and the earth. That's what it's saying. All those things. If we were to go back through those scriptures, that's exactly what you'd see. The Word of God made flesh. The Word of God in letter, in other words, people writing letters on, on a page, is now the Word of God in life. Isn't that amazing that something written on a page is now suddenly animated in a human body, in a human being, in a human person, in a human personality? Jesus! 
He's the word of God in letter, now become the word of God in life. He's the word of God in law. It's now the word of God in spirit and truth. What was, now, what was once law is now actually spirit and truth. The word of God in proverb is now the word of God in person. Jesus is the law of God become flesh. You know that he's the Ten Commandments on two feet? He's perfect righteousness. Without violation, without sin in him, no guile in his mouth. He is the perfection of the law. The law isn't bad. The law is perfect righteousness. However, for you to be under the law instead of under grace means that you must fulfill it to perfection. And that's why it has condemnation written all over it. But it doesn't mean the law is bad. Jesus is the fulfillment of the law. He fulfilled it to perfection. The law was given, and it says it's a schoolmaster which leads us to Christ. It is literally a picture of Christ. That's how he behaves. That's God's perfect righteousness, and you are unrighteous. You are not as he is. Jesus is the sacrifices, the feasts, the Sabbaths, the Jubilee, and the tabernacle temple become flesh. He's all those things. Everything you measure in the Old Testament points to Jesus. He's the fulfillment of it. That entire culture of the Hebrew, you know that it was a prophetic culture? It was all talking about someone to come. It's talking about Jesus Christ who fulfilled it in every regard. Jesus is the wisdom of God become flesh. The Proverbs, you go through the Proverbs, it talks about a foolish man and a wise man. The foolish man is what we could call the firstborn. The secondborn is the wise man. And so all throughout scripture you see that flesh, spirit, Firstborn, Cain. Secondborn, Abel. Firstborn, Ishmael. Secondborn, Isaac. Firstborn, Esau. Secondborn, Jacob. Firstborn is the flesh. Secondborn is the spirit. Adam, Jesus. Old covenant, new covenant. The firstborn proves the weakness of the flesh, and the secondborn proves to be the wise man, proves to be the one that can succeed. Jesus is the second born. He's even the Proverbs become flesh. He is the wise man. The one that spurns the old Adamic life. The one that is born in sin and lives as a man ought to live. Jesus is the wisdom of God become flesh. Jesus is the prophecy of God become flesh. He fulfilled all the prophecy. Everything that pointed to the Messiah. Who fulfilled it? Jesus. Every bit of it, he fulfilled it. Jesus is the histories of Israel become flesh. I mean, it's just incredible. Israel is called forth out of Egypt. Well, guess who else is called forth out of Egypt? Jesus. David is born in Bethlehem. The great Bethlehemites of ancient days. David. And then you have Boaz. Well, who's born in Bethlehem? Jesus. You know where all the mighties were born to? In Bethlehem. And so this is like a pattern. Even the history of Israel is recognized in the person of Jesus Christ in his life. In other words, Jesus is the word of God become flesh. Who is this Jesus? The Bible declares that he is canon tested and approved. You see, in the Old Testament, you have a test. You have a measurement. See, canon is a measuring rod. And let's say if you laid it down on this uh, stage, it would be as long as that top step there, okay? And it had to be perfect in its measurement without discrepancy. And another rod could be set next to it. If it didn't measure perfectly, then the new rod would be thrown out. To be measured as canon, you must measure perfectly against an existing rod. And so it's, it's used for measurement. And so what we have is we have a rod known as canon. When we talk about the canon of scripture in the Church of Jesus Christ today, we have 66 books of the Bible that have divine right to rule and control our lives as Christians. And that's the principle of canon. That's how it works. Moses started out with the first five books, and that was the first rod. And then every subsequent book that was added to the Bible was measured. And it had to pass what was known as the canon test. The measurement. It had to prove of the same root. It had to prove the same fruit. It had to prove that it was of divine origin. Otherwise, it would be discarded. It doesn't have to be faulty. It doesn't have to be lies. It's just not divine. The word of God has been tested and approved throughout the ages, and it's been proven and shown as divine. It is not just the words of men. Though it be written by men, they were men carried along by the Holy Spirit. This Bible is canon tested and approved. So, who is Jesus? Well, there's 39 books in the Old Testament, and they set forth a pattern, they set forth a test of the Messiah. 
And he had to pass every single one of those tests. If he failed at one test, the Bible itself, the canon itself, says stone him as a false prophet. For he is falsely representing me. Unless a man can perfectly fulfill the Messiah test, he is not your Messiah. But what happens if a man does pass the Messiah test? You know what that means? If he measures, he's included in the canon. And he has divine right and authority to rule our lives. And that's the principle of Jesus Christ. He was measured against the Old Testament. And though the Jews have a tough time admitting it, he was perfect in his measurements. Every single test point that he must pass, he did. It's extraordinary. He proved the Son of God. See, what you'll see in this is you'll see the Old Testament canon test, Psalm 2, 6 through 9, and then you'll see the New Testament fulfillment. He proved the Son of God. He proved the seed of the woman. He proved the seed of Abraham. He proved the seed of Isaac. In other words, he couldn't just be born of the line of Abraham. He must be born of the line of Isaac. But not just the line of Isaac. He must be of the line of David. And he proved the seed of David, which is why the genealogies in the New Testament are so critical. They show that both Mary and Joseph came of the line of David. And because Joseph also came of the line of David, you know what they had to do when the census was being taken? They had to go to Joseph's hometown, which was Bethlehem. All of this is critical to understand the Messiah and to understand who Jesus is. He proved to be born of a virgin and he proved to be Emmanuel, God with us. He proved to be born in Bethlehem, Judea. By the way, he had to be. If these things aren't true, if there is one discrepancy, he is not your Messiah. He proved that kings fell down before him offering gifts. They had to. Kings had to fall down before him and offer him gifts. Well, how's a little baby going to pull that one off? He's born of a little girl in a little shanty, little stable. How in the world are you going to get kings to come in, bow down, and give gifts? Well, they did. He proved to be called out of Egypt. He proved that Elijah came before him. He proved anointed with the Spirit. He proved that his ministry commenced in Galilee. He proved to enter Jerusalem riding upon a colt. He proved undesirable to many. He proved meek. He proved to be without guile. He proved to be consumed with zeal for God's house. He proved that he bore the reproach. Each one of these is what the Messiah had to bear. This is called the Messiah test. And if he doesn't bear this, if he can't pass this test, he's not your Messiah. But what if he does? What if he does pass this test? He's not just your Messiah, which to you know, us Americans, that means very little. What's a Messiah? That means he's canon. He has divine right to rule and control your life. He is King of kings and Lord of lords. And what he says goes. And if it disagrees with what you think, you're wrong. He's right. You submit and bend your knee and confess that he is Lord to the glory of God the Father. He proved that he bore the reproach. He had to be betrayed by a friend. And he proved it. He was betrayed by a friend. He proved that his sheep were scattered. When the shepherd was struck, the sheep had to be scattered. That was one of the proofs of the Messiah. And guess what? When the shepherd was struck, the sheep scattered. Again, a proof that he was the Messiah. I love this one. 21 is literally one of my favorites. He proved to be sold for 30 pieces of silver in the potter's field purchased with the money. He had to be betrayed by a friend. He had to be sold for 30 pieces of silver. And then that silver needed to be cast down in the temple, picked back up, and it had to be used to buy a potter's field. How is Jesus going to do that when he's pinned to two pieces of wood? How does he pull this off? This is miraculous. Even those that are crucifying him are fulfilling his messiahship. Judas is literally being wielded as an instrument of proof unto the almighty God. Satan filled Judas, it says. And guess what? Satan himself and all his machinations is only doing one thing, and that's proving the godness of of Jesus Christ. He proved to be numbered with the criminals. If he died alone, he wouldn't have been the Messiah. He had to be numbered with the criminals. He proved to go silent as a, silently as a lamb unto slaughter. If he talked on his way to slaughter, if he defended himself, he wouldn't have been the Messiah. He proved to make intercession for his murderers. He proved that lots were cast for his clothing. In Psalm 22, it gives a vivid description of the cross. And they cast lots for my clothing, it says. Well, guess whose clothing lots were cast for? Jesus. He proved to die. He had to die. Isn't that amazing? To be the Messiah, he had to die. 
He proved that none of his bones were broken. If one of his bones were broken, he wouldn't have been the Messiah. And in crucifixion, bones aren't necessarily broken in normal crucifixion. However, to hasten crucifixion, to quicken it, they break the legs, and that causes suffocation. But when the Roman soldier came up to Jesus to break his legs, and thusly disprove his Messiahship, by the way, the man noticed that he was already dead, and instead pierced his side, which was that was the fulfillment of his Messiahship. For he proved to be pierced. Isn't that amazing? It's a Roman soldier being controlled by Almighty God to demonstrate Jesus is dead. How could he have any more say in the matter? This is amazing. It's God's hallmark upon this man who is no mere man. He's God himself. He proved risen again from the dead on the third day. I don't know how many of you were able to pull that one off. He literally gives the sign of Jonah as the proof. Tear down this temple and I will rebuild it in three days. Just keep your mouth shut, Jesus. That's going to be very hard to pull off. You don't want to say something's going to get you stoned. No one's going to believe you. I mean, because how in the world is that going to happen? This is no mere man. He proved to have ascended. God also hath highly exalted him. See, this is after the flow of Philippians 2 where it talks about Jesus who considered it not robbery to be equal with God. But he condescended and took on the form of a man, humbled himself in, in, unto obedience and even obedience unto death. And get this, death on a cross. He didn't just humble himself. He became a worm and no man. And it says, after he fulfills his canon test, after he showcases the Messiahship, it says, God also has highly exalted him and given him a name which is above every name, that at the name of Jesus every knee should bow of things in heaven and things in the earth and things under the earth, and that every tongue should confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. He's canon. He has lordship. He has authority in the church of Jesus Christ, which in his time he shall show who is the blessed and only potentate, I love, potentate's not a typical word. It's like one of those ones that comes up once a year in like some Christmas carol. <laughs> it's majesty. It's kingly authority. Sovereignty. So who is the blessed and only potentate? The king of kings and lord of lords. Who is that only one? Who is the one that in his time will show? It's Jesus. These shall make war with the Lamb, and the Lamb shall overcome them, for he is Lord of lords and King of kings, and they that are with him are called and chosen and faithful. And he hath written his vesture, he has, hath written on his vesture and on his thigh a name written, King of kings and Lord of lords. Oh, I love so, uh, Revelation 19. I mean, on his thigh is written, King of kings and Lord of lords. Love it. So, how should we treat this king? The Bible's actually very clear on how you treat the word. It makes it, it, it actually gives enunciation and direction. This is the word of God. This is how you treat it. So if you know that Jesus is the word of God and he's the fulfillment of the word of God, doesn't it follow that the way we are commanded to treat the word of God in text, we should also treat the word of God in person? So here's what I have. I have a list, and I'm going to give you the first line is going to be the way we are commanded to treat the word of God in text. The next line is the extrapolation that says, so if that's true, this is how we treat the word of God in person, Jesus. The word of God in text, in Isaiah 66, it says that we must tremble at it. The word of God made flesh, tremble before him. The word of God in text, receive it with all readiness and search it daily. The word of God made flesh, receive him with all readiness and search his heart and mind daily in order to serve him better and love him more. The word of God in text, receive it in much affliction. The word of God made flesh, receive him in much affliction. The word of God in text, receive it as it is in truth, the word of God. The word of God made flesh, receive him as he is in truth, God himself. The word of God in text, receive it gladly. The word of God made flesh, receive him gladly. The word of God in text, keep it, follow it, bend to it, and revere it. The word of God made flesh, keep him in the center of your heart, follow him, bend to his way, and revere him. The word of God in text, treat it as precious. The word of God made flesh, treat him as precious. The word of God in text, let it always reside in your tongue. The word of God made flesh, let the singular message of Jesus and him crucified always reside on your tongue. 
The word of God in text, let it perform that which it promises. Let it build the temple. Let it be verified in your life. Let it bring you the rest of God. The word of God made flesh. Let him perform that which he promises. Let him build you into his temple. Let him be verified in your life. Let him bring you the rest of God. The word of God in text, conform to its pattern for carrying the holy presence of God. The word of God made flesh. Bear the holy presence of God in the same manner he did. The word of God in text, be always mindful of it. Abide in its reality. Live in the shadow of its sublime truth. The word of God made flesh. Be always mindful of him. Abide in him and live in the shadow of his wings. The word of God in text, praise it and trust it. The word of God made flesh. Praise him and trust him. The word of God in text, publish it. The word of God made flesh. Publish his life by demonstrating his power at work in you. The word of God in text, listen to it. Heed its every utterance. The word of God made flesh. Listen to his voice. Heed his every utterance. The word of God in text, allow it to try your soul, purify your heart, and prune your life. The word of God made flesh, allow him to try your soul, purify your heart, and prune your life. The word of God in text, hide it in your heart, cherish it in your innermost being, protect it as your most sacred possession. The word of God made flesh, hide him in your heart, cherish him in your innermost being, protect him as your most sacred possession. The word of God in text, never forget it. The word of God made flesh, never forget him. The word of God in text, be quickened by its power, its grace, its majesty. The word of God made flesh, be quickened by his power, his grace, and his majesty. The word of God in text, allow it to be your strength. The word of God made flesh, allow him to be your strength. The word of God in text, trust in it. The word of God made flesh, trust in him. The word of God in text, hope in it. The word of God made flesh, hope in him. The word of God in text, love it and delight in its purity. The word of God made flesh, love him and delight in his purity. The word of God in text, meditate on it. The word of God made flesh, meditate on him. The word of God in text, let it be the joy and rejoicing of your heart. The word of God made flesh, let him be the joy and rejoicing of your heart. The word of God in text, let it be your sustenance, the food of your soul, the life of your being. The word of God made flesh, let him be your sustenance, the food of your soul, the life of your being. Who is this Jesus? The Bible declares that he is the manifestation of the God of the Old Covenant. For in him, Jesus, dwells all the fullness of the Godhead bodily. For it pleased the Father that in him, Jesus, should all fullness dwell. Some of us have this concept that Jesus is a upgrade to what we see in the Old Testament, that God sort of got all his meanness out of his system and suddenly became a nice guy in the New Testament. Well, by the way, God has always been good. God has not changed. There's no altering in God, no shadow of turning in him. He's the same yesterday, today, and forever. Jesus is the manifestation of the God of, get this, the Old Testament, the Old Covenant. God didn't alter. He revealed himself, and where you might misconstrue him in the Old Testament, same God. And ironically, where you might misconstrue him in the New Testament, same God in the Old Testament. He is interested in rescuing his people, the same God that says, for so God loved. Same God in Old Testament. He didn't just suddenly become loving. Always been the same. And he's always been fulfilled and revealed to us in Jesus. He that hath seen me hath seen the Father. How are you going to see the Father? How are you going to understand the Father? You see Jesus. Jesus is the manifold revelation of the God of the Old Testament. Jesus is El Shaddai, Lord God Almighty. Jesus is El Elyon, the Most High God. Jesus is Adonai, Lord Master. Jesus is Yahweh, Lord Jehovah. Jesus is Jehovah Nisi, the Lord my banner, the Lord my miracle. Jesus is Jehovah Ra, the Lord my shepherd. Jesus is Jehovah Rapha, the Lord that heals. Jesus is Jehovah Shama, the Lord is there. Jesus is Jehovah Sidkenu, the Lord our righteousness. Jesus is Jehovah Mekadeshikim, the Lord who sanctifies you, the Lord who makes you holy. Jesus is El Olam, the everlasting God, the God of eternity, the God of the universe, the God of ancient days. Jesus is Elohim, God, judge, creator. Jesus is Kana, jealous. Jesus is Jehovah Jireh, the Lord will provide. Jesus is Jehovah Shalom, the Lord is peace. Jesus is Jehovah Sabaoth, the Lord of hosts, the Lord of powers. Who is this Jesus? 
The Bible declares that he is overall, God forever, all-powerful, and wholly sovereign. He's not a mere man. He's God Almighty. My God has measured the waters of this earth in the hollow of his hand, meted out the heavens with a span, comprehended the dust of the earth in a measure, weighed the mountains in scales and the hills in a balance. To him the nations are as a drop in a bucket and are counted as a small dust of the balance. When he heads off to war, there are none that can stay his hand. He sits as king between the mighty cherubim, above all, over all, and in control of all. The creator of the heavens and the earth, God of all the kingdoms of this earth. He can bind the sweet influences of Pleiades and loose the bands of Orion. He can set the dominion of his ordinances in the earth. He can send forth lightning, number the clouds, and stay the bottles of heaven. He is the mighty God, the everlasting God, over all God blessed forever. The God of the whole earth, his throne is forever and ever. He is the almighty which is, which was, and which is to come. The creator of all things, the upholder of all things, the father of eternity, the beginning and the ending, the alpha and the omega, the first and the last. He is the rock of ages, the head of every man, the head of all principality and power, Lord of lords, Lord both of the dead and living, Lord of all, Lord over all. He is the prince of princes, the prince of the kings of the earth, he that filleth all in all, the king of kings, the righteous judge, the king of saints, king of nations, king over all the earth, the king of glory, crowned with many crowns, and he sitteth king forever. Before him all the inhabitants of the earth are reputed as nothing, and he does according to his will in the army of heaven, and among the inhabitants of the earth, and none can stay his hand or say unto him, What doest thou? Before the mountains were brought forth, or ever he had formed the earth and the world, even from everlasting to everlasting, he was God. When the kings of the earth set themselves and the rulers take counsel together against him, he shall laugh and he shall hold them in derision. He is bound by nothing but his own nature and his own law. He is not limited in power nor governed in action by the will or the pleasure of any angel, demon, or man. But rather he is limited and governed only by the dictums and restraints of his loving prerogative to gain for himself a peculiar people, to establish his kingdom in this earth and to shed abroad his glory unto the heathen. In the not so distant future when he will return to bring terrible judgment to the nations and his feet shall touch down on Mount Olivet and see it divide asunder, every knee will bow and every tongue will confess that he is Lord. And all will behold the Ancient of Days, whose eyes are as a flame of fire, whose voice is as the sound of many waters, and whose countenance is as the sun shining in all its strength. They will, all, they will see the fiery stream issuing forth from before him, the thousand thousands ministering unto him, and the ten thousand times ten thousand that stand before him at the judgment. And all will behold the one at whose feet all crowns will be cast, for he is worthy to receive glory and honor and power. For he has created all things, and for his pleasure they are and were created. So in concert with the noble King David, I pronounce, Thine, O Lord, is the greatness and the power and the glory and the victory and the majesty. For all that is in the heaven and in the earth is thine. Thine is the kingdom, O Lord, and thou art exalted as head above all. Who is this Jesus? The Bible declares that he is salvation and that outside of him no man can be saved. Now, watch, I don't get all mealy-mouthed on this point. I know what the culture says and I know what politically, political correctness declares. You are not allowed to say that Jesus is the only way because then you're being insensitive to other people. And I'm here to tell you that if you don't declare him to be the only way, you're being insensitive to Jesus. I don't know whose side you're on in this. If you're kowtowing to the opinions of men, or if you truly want to agree with the king of all kings, who with his own mouth declared that there is no other way to the Father but by him. It's not my opinion, it's his. I just happen to agree with him on that point. And on every other point he makes. He is God Almighty, King of Kings, Lord of Lords, Canon. He has divine right to rule and control our lives, and when he speaks, he's correct. It's not insensitivity to this world when we stand on the facts of Jesus Christ. It's the only true love that we can give them. Do we truly love them? Then give them truth. For I determined not to know anything among you save Jesus Christ and him crucified. It's an incredible statement. See, Paul wasn't just about Jesus. He was about the work of Jesus. And it's very important for those, there's many churches out there that love Jesus, but they oftentimes have a very fleshly version of it. There's a lot of emotion, there's a lot of drama in it, 
They talk about Jesus, but it's like a Jesus that is controlled by the flesh. And I want you to realize Paul's message was Jesus Christ and him crucified. This is what Paul limited himself down to. And he said, if you can get Jesus and you can understand the work of Jesus, then you have everything Jesus intended for you. You want to worship Jesus, then you must behold the cross. He came to this earth. He took on this form, God in the flesh, so that he could rescue you. And that rescue is found on the cross, and it's the only source of salvation, the only one. Jesus saith unto him, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man comes unto the Father but by me. Neither is there salvation in any other, for there is none other name under heaven given among men whereby we must be saved. There's no other options here. There's Jesus and that cross. And that cross, when you behold it, is your salvation. Back in the times of Noah, there was one means of salvation, and it was known as an ark. And the door to the ark was open. And anyone that would enter into that ark would be saved. The judgment was coming. Jesus is like an ark, and the door is open. In fact, he is even the door. He is the way and the door. He is salvation. Salvation is a person. It's not a concept. It's not an idea. It's a person, and it's Jesus. He is the door and the way through that door. It's Jesus. And if you are in that ark when the rains come, then there is salvation, there is preservation, there is protection. But if you are outside that ark, then you do not have the benefits of the ark. The ark is built in such a way where it can preserve you from the falling rain. It can preserve you from the rising waters. It can cause you to float in the midst of judgment. And the same is true with Jesus Christ. Jesus is the only means of salvation, and we can find it nowhere else. And so Jesus says, I need you to get in me. It's a strange concept that we get in Christ Jesus. How do you get in something? Well, he describes his work on the cross as a robe of righteousness. And if we are clothed in that robe, then no longer are we going to be judged in accordance with our behavior and our sin. But we will now be seen in light in the Father, Father's presence with the righteousness, the purity, and the life of God Almighty himself. We will be clothed in the purity and the guileless nature of Jesus Christ. And that is the only means of salvation. You must be in Christ Jesus. At the judgment day when you make your appeal, if you turn to your good works and you dig in your pocket and say, well, I think I have a few coins of good works here. Well, then this make it. There's only one thing that can truly offer you admittance into that heavenly kingdom, and that is Jesus Christ. You must be found in him. You must be found in him. Wherefore he is able also to save them to the uttermost that come unto God by him, seeing he ever lives to make intercession for them. Jesus didn't just live 2,000 years ago. You know that he lives today? He didn't just live and rescue you 2,000 years ago. You know that, that same rescuer ever lives to rescue you today? You know that he is ever ready to supply all of his merit, all of his virtue, all of his strength on your behalf today? You need help. Just acknowledge it and say, Jesus, I need you to exert your authority, your rescue for me today. You know that you need that every moment of your life? You must live in Christ. It doesn't do you a lot of good to get in the ark and then halfway through the flood, poke your head out and jump into the water. You live and abide and remain in Christ, and that is salvation. That is life abundant. The same Jesus that came and gave up his life 2,000 years ago didn't just ascend to heaven, now he's kicked back, you know, being fed grapes and fanned. He is laboring for the saints of God. He ever lives to make intercession for us. I love this line. Wherefore, he is able also to save them to the uttermost. Well, I know someone who desires to save you to the uttermost. Not just desires, but is able. I love the word able. He's able to save you to the uttermost. That's fact. Take it to the bank in your spiritual life. You have a God who has given everything to rescue you and will still continue to give everything he has at his disposal, which, by the way, is everything, 
to enable you to succeed, to be saved, to be strong. Having therefore, brethren, boldness to enter into the holiest by the blood of Jesus. Where does your confidence come from? The blood of Jesus. You have that in and through the work of the cross. His work is your work. You can't get in by work. You get in by his work. Your work, according to Jesus, is to believe. That's your job. That work is good enough for me. That's your job. Your job is to believe that his work is sufficient. Having therefore, brethren, boldness to enter into the holiest by the blood of Jesus, by a new and living way, which he has consecrated for us through the veil, that is to say, his flesh, his own body. And having a high priest over the house of God, let us draw near with a true heart and full assurance of faith, having our hearts sprinkled from an evil conscience and our bodies washed with pure water. We have so much Christianity today which talks about Jesus but lives in the flesh. But the work of the cross, if you're in Christ, then he takes you where he goes. Just like getting on a plane. If that plane is going to, to England, well then getting on that plane takes you to England. You get in Jesus, where Jesus goes, you go. So when you know your position in Christ, you actually understand something about the cross and it becomes very intimate and dear to you. When he went to that cross and you are in him, that means you were with him at the cross. And when he died, his death was your death. You have an old life known as the old man that's ruling your body, but there's only one way out and that is Jesus must deal with it. And he did. And when you're in Christ Jesus, you have all the benefits of that cross. And you can literally declare with utter confidence, my old man is dead. Paul says, reckon your old man dead. Reckon it. Take it. Stick it in your account. It's done. It was finished 2,000 years ago. You must take it, though. If I stuck a $20 bill up here on the, the stage, and I said it belongs to you, and you just left today and said, yeah, Eric gave me a $20 bill. How nice. But you didn't come up and take it? Then you don't have the power and the strength of that 20 when you go to try and spend it. You need the actual strength and merit and virtue of the work of the cross and you must reach out and take it. The old man was crucified with Christ. And when he was buried, your old behavior was buried. And when he rose again from the dead, you were raised into newness of life. And Paul says, reckon yourself, dead indeed unto sin, but alive unto God. Alive! How? In Christ. It's his work. You have been given a vehicle, a way to be saved, to be rescued, and to come alive. And his name is Jesus. And when he goes to the right hand of the Father and takes his seat of all authority, where are you? It says you're in him. And where he is, you are. You are seated with him in heavenly places in Christ Jesus. And his authority is now your authority. And there is nothing that pushes around the saints of God. We have the privilege of drawing near by the blood of Jesus to come into the most intimate quarter, to the literal heart of Almighty God. We're in Him at the right hand, His feet, everything is under Him. And where are we located? In Him. Should we cower before anything in this world? We belong to Jesus, who's the King of kings and the Lord of lords. Who is this Jesus? The Bible declares that he is holy, holy, holy. In the year that King Uzziah died, I saw also the Lord sitting upon a throne, high and lifted up, and his train filled the temple. Above it stood the seraphims. Each one had six wings. With two he covered his face. With two he covered his feet. And with two he did fly. And one cried unto another and said, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord of hosts. The whole earth is full of his glory. In Revelation 4, it says, And the four beasts had each of them six wings about him, and they were full of eyes within, and they rest not day and night, saying, Holy, 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 Lord God Almighty, which was, and it is, and is to come. When those beasts give glory and honor and thanks to him that sat on the throne, who liveth forever and ever, the four and twenty elders fall down before him that sat on the throne. And worship him that lives forever and ever. And cast their crowns before the throne, saying, Thou art worthy, O Lord, to receive glory and honor and power. For thou hast created all things, and for thy pleasure they are and were created. Hagios is the Greek word for what we know as holy. 
It's not a very pretty word, I understand that. Hogios doesn't sounds like an unclean animal, and ironically, holy is the opposite. And so it is quite an irony that the Greek word literally stimulates the wrong notion in our mind. But I want you to realize this is possibly one of the most beautiful words in all of Scripture. Hagios, holy, which to us, in a very simple way, could mean otherly. He's otherly. It's like the, he's not like us. He's different than us. He's altogether other. We are this way, but he is not like that. We are dirty, but he's clean. We are stained, but he is cleansed. He, there's nothing, no impurity in him. He is whiter than snow. He is hagios. Unpacking the beauty of hagios. It's based out of the word hagos. That's its root derivative, and which means something that strikes men with utter awe and wonder. And so the very root for the concept of God being holy is this notion of a thing that strikes awe and wonder. And so the word hagos, you'll, you'll notice at the very bottom, see my mathematical equation down there, it's hognos and chag, which is the two combining words to create hagos, which is basically a form of hagios that we're going to go into. But root one, hagnos, it means perfect, unsullied, otherly, awe-striking, bewildering, extravagant purity. It's not just normal purity. It's bewildering purity, untouched, unstained. It's hagnos. Root number two is hag, which is a feast, festival sacrifice, a pilgrim feast. And so what you literally have is this concept of a feast or a meal mixed with something of great purity. Okay, brace yourselves for where we're headed with this. Now, look at it. Great purity, otherness, become a meal. Okay? Buckle your seatbelts. Hagios. Remember our word was hagos that it comes from? Hagos is a thing, but hagios is a person. That's the difference between the two words. Hagos is a thing, but hagios, which was a thing, is now revealed as a person. Remember what hagos was? It's a thing that strikes utter awe and wonder. Well, when Jesus has said that he's hagios, he's a person that strikes awe and wonder. It's something that strikes men with utter awe and wonder. The, the something that, has, that strikes men with utter awe and wonder has come. When we say hag, hagios, that's what we mean. Holy! The something that strikes men with utter awe and wonder has come. His name is Jesus and he is hagios, hagios, hagios. Hagios, 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 holy, holy, holy. We cry out in utter astonishment, struck with awe. For the perfect, unsullied, awe-striking purity and otherness has himself become the food for the feast. The perfect, unsullied, awe-striking purity and otherness has himself become the food for the feast. And since holy is always come in threes. The perfect, unsullied, awe-striking purity and otherness has himself become the food for the feast. Oh, little town of Bethlehem. That sound familiar? We're going back to that scripture in the very beginning. But thou, Bethlehem Ephrata, though thou be little among the thousands of Judah, yet out of thee shall he come forth unto me that is to be ruler in Israel, whose goings forth have been from old, from everlasting. God chooses Bethlehem Ephrata. Bethlehem, which means house of bread. That's the typical understanding that you, would, that you would know, house of bread. But technically, the way that word works in the Hebrew is it would more properly be said house of the food of God. Or one of the other ways that it could be interpreted, but no man would ever think of interpreting it this way, is the body of God, because a house and a body are the same, the body of God become food. But who would ever think of translating it that way? That's what it could mean, but uh, you wouldn't actually say that. Why would the body of God ever become food? Jesus was born in Bethlehem. He was born in the very place that declares the body of God become food. Ephrath, which means ash heap, place of fruitfulness, life out of death. The body of God become food. Life out of death. That's where Jesus was born. 
By the way, it's the place of the new birth. The feeding trough. Jesus was born in Bethlehem. Body of God become food. And what did God say to the shepherds? You shall find the babe lying in a fatne. You know what that means? A feeding trough in Bethlehem. You will find this babe, this one who is king of kings and lord of lords. You will find him in a stable, lying in a fatne, a feeding trough, in the town of the, house, the body of God become food. Utter astonishment and awe, holy, holy, holy. The perfect, unsullied, awe-striking wonder and glory of Almighty God has limited himself and condescended to be stuck in a feeding trough so that he can become food. John 6, Then Jesus said unto them, Verily, verily, I say unto you, Moses gave you not that bread from heaven, but my Father gives you the true bread from heaven. For the bread of God is he which comes down from heaven and gives life unto the world. Then said they unto him, Lord, evermore give us this bread. And Jesus said unto them, I am the bread of life. He that comes to me shall never hunger, and he that believes on me shall never thirst. I am that bread of life. Your fathers did eat manna in the wilderness and are dead. This is the bread which comes down from heaven that a man may eat thereof and die and not die. I am the living bread which came down from heaven. If any man eat of this bread, he shall live forever. And the bread that I will give is my flesh, which I will give for the life of the world. The Jews therefore strove among themselves, saying, How can this man give us his flesh to eat? Then Jesus said unto them, Verily, verily, I say unto you, except you eat the flesh of the Son of Man and drink his blood. I want you to realize who Jesus is talking to. He's talking to a people that has the strictest dietary code on planet Earth. And he is literally saying, you must be cannibals. This is such an offense. And Jesus knows the culture he's speaking to. How would he know it? He built it. He built it and then literally came in as a stumbling block to it. Do you recognize that the entire dietary code was to prohibit you from taking of any life outside the life of God? Do not drink any other blood, for blood is life. But when my blood comes, you must drink it. You have been prohibited from taking any other life source, but the life that will save you. And now that life has come. And unless you eat of this body and drink of my blood, you have no life. You have no life in you. Whoso eats my flesh and drinks my blood has eternal life. And I will raise him up at the last day, for my flesh is meat indeed, and my blood is drink indeed. He that eats my flesh and drinks my blood dwells in me, and I in him. As the living Father has sent me, and I live by the Father, so he that eats me, it's actually what it says, he that eats me, even he shall live by me. Jesus came to offer us a way of salvation, and that way is himself. And that way is discovered and understood and unwrapped at the cross of Jesus Christ. You cannot have Christianity without that cross. And at that cross, Jesus' body was broken and his blood was given. And unless you partake of that cross work, unless you're first of all clothed in it, then you cannot have that life enter you. You see, when Jesus is talking here, it can be somewhat unusual to our ears. It can be a little mysterious but the mystery that has been hidden for ages and generations has now been revealed, and that is Christ needs to be in us. That's what he came to do, not just to clothe us, but to enter inside of us. He is food and drink. He intends, his very life intends to enter in and be housed within us. This great, holy, holy, holy God is condescending to say, I need your home, your body. And when he moves into your body, you know what he calls it? A place of new birth. It's an ash heap. Life has come out of death. And you become Bethlehem. You become a body that becomes food. You're spent and you're given up and God lays you in a feeding trough 
so that the weak around you can find sustenance in and through your givenness. But he must have you. Jesus Christ, the King of kings, the Lord of lords, majesty, the only potentate, has condescended to come so low to rescue you, to wash your feet. And he asks for everything in your life. He says, I've saved you. I've given you life. Now, will you give me your life? This is Christianity. Christianity is beholding the holy, holy, holy. Hagios, 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 God. And it's beholding that God in Jesus Christ. The body of God become food. The God, body of God become a feast. And that's why we as Christians celebrate communion. It's to remember this.